Hello, everyone, um, and thank you. Um, today, I want to talk a little bit more about AI and augmented intelligence, and, and principally how it can serve a learning musician and a company that is attempting to do things for the learning musician. So it's quite dissimilar from the talk that we've just heard, which was more about how professionals reach professionals and, and, and take some of the drudge work away from them they already know how to do. This is about helping naive people to be less naive. Um, so, as we've just announced, that was my job title for three years, um, and I'm still working at Rolly, but as a consultant. So, um, with their permission, I'm using the affiliation, and yet I am still at Rolly for two days a week, but not actually in a full-time capacity. I wanted to get that clear, just in case I say anything blasphemous, which, which I won't. Um, so, what I really want to talk about is augmented intelligence built by a business, so there'll be a little bit of a commercial focus, and in service of musicians. And this illustration is, is a Japanese robot from the mid-80s. Somebody made an android called Wasubot that played piano organ, and, um, and as you can see, it's doing a fairly good job, but it only really played organs when it was being demonstrated, and the reason was that the actuators were completely incapable of any degree of expression. So. Um, it's just a little bit of a diversion there, but somebody made something like that nearly 40 years ago, and it did do something. But that's not what we're interested in today, it's just a pretty picture. But first, you saw this slide earlier. Music is not optical character recognition, right? The problem, well, the, the problems that artificial intelligence at first solved were quite well-bounded problems where the criteria for success are very well known. So with optical character recognition, you have examples of handwriting, and the um, size of the input is quite well known because it's a matrix of, of pixels, and the output is quite well known. You've got a series of probability functions depending on what character it thinks it is. And um, the criteria for success are very well known, so either it matches what the human writer intended to convey or it doesn't. Um, and all of the classic AI problems are basically problems of that class where criteria for success is well understood, input and output criteria are well understood. Um, and, and the first non-trivial example of, um, of AI in action was really handwriting recognition, um, probably followed about 10 years later by basically what Google did to search. Um, if we're looking, about, we're looking at the future of AI, it's really already with us, and the commercial winners and losers are already being picked, and, and, and the field is happening around us, and we just haven't called it a revolution. Um, and more pertinently and more newsworthily these days, um, in March 2016, um, the first AI was created that could um, consistently beat the best Go player in the world. And Go was always seen as a, as a sort of archetypical last citadel of, humans, um, of human supremacy, really, in gameplay. And as soon as a computer could reliably beat Go, it could basically reliably beat a human in any procedural game. But again, music is not Go. Um, the optimizations that enabled this to happen were basically optimizations in, um, in, in the data trees that were being stored and the kind of look-ahead algorithms. Um, the, the, the improvements were, were nothing to do with um, being more human, it was just to do with cutting out all the dimensionalities of the data problems that could actually be solved in real time. And so they were computational solutions. Um, again, music is not to go because, well, we're just coming to it, and, uh, this is going to be a slide I spent plenty of time talking about, but here is Icarus. Um, and this is a, Icarus is a, is a nice little a fellow to, um, to inspire us. But um, artificial intelligence just optimizes your route to a result which you already know and you already understand. And if it's right, you can say that's right, and if it's wrong, you can say it's wrong. And if it's neither right nor wrong, or you don't quite know how to measure its rightness or wrongness, I, uh, AI isn't going to help you achieve an answer because basically if its result is right, it knows how to train itself. <coughs> You optimize the things you measure, so your output, whether it's good or bad, the goodness or badness is entirely determined by a human agent deciding whether or not it approaches or detracts from what it is they're trying to achieve. You measure the things you value, and you basically get what you deserve. Um, most feedback systems are like this, and business is like this in a very real way. Um, I used to work with a programmer, um, and he talked about an old job that he had many years ago. And it was either SSL or Sony, but it was some audio company but back in the early days of their formation. And they had a sign there to, to, to troll, if you like, their manager. And the sign, the motto of the department he was working with was software that serves you right. Uh, and embrace the ambiguity. 
And I, I quite like that. I, I, I'll use that again at some point. I'll use it with a presentation. His name is Bill O'Kent, she still works at Focus, right? Great chat. Anyway. Um, the other thing I want to talk about with Icarus is that um, humans have an advantage in that we don't work in a procedural way. Um, we say we do, and Mark Wahlberg a couple of days ago published his, um, his daily routine on Twitter, and firstly, it seems completely implausible that anybody would be that robotic. And secondly, human beings don't work like that. What we do that a computer doesn't do is we make up the goal as we go along. Um, we decide, you know, am I writing a PhD thesis or am I baking a cake? And, um, and the goal changes as, you, as, you, as the day goes on. Um, you can post-rationalize success from failure, um, which is a very powerful thing to do because often you don't know what you're doing at the beginning of a problem. There's this whole meta layer. We can procrastinate. We can embrace distractions. We can cheat. A human Go player might drum on the table to put the opponent off or mess up the board slightly when they make their move or use any kind of psychological trick to gain an upper hand, which a computer is not going to do. So there's all these sort of meta layers that a human being has. Um, and we can learn from the failures of people like Icarus. And, um, and, and, and that failure is something, you know, um, obviously he died, he didn't get to where he wanted to go, but hey, he's immortal in a way. <laughs> so perhaps he's a kind of success. And this is the kind of post-rationalization that an AI algorithm cannot do. Um, the other thing is that there is a space in music, assisted composition for it's never going to displace high art. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. But firstly, we like to admire people who are very good at what they do, and we like to watch them doing it and think, you know, perhaps physically speaking, I can achieve that. Uh, mentally, culturally, I'm not ready, and I might never be able to achieve that. But you can appreciate genius. You can't necessarily appreciate the creative work that's been done by a computer imitating human beings. And you might not want to. So while assisted composition and so on might have an application in um, in, in, that, in, in places where the criteria for success is not, is this a masterpiece, but is this not annoying? So things like lift music and hold music and procedurally generated stuff for low attention music. Um, splicing together hundreds of hours of computer game music from a few phrases so that it just doesn't drill into the user's head when they're playing their game over a hundred hours or so. Things like this, music which is designed to be consumed when your attention isn't raised, or commodity art, hotel art, that kind of thing. This is a place where there's room for AI, if not to replace humans, then to certainly speed up the process. Um, the whole point of the arts is to make life worthwhile. Uh, so writing ourselves out of it would be stupid. And I, I just want to leave that thought with you before we go further. Um, just as a provocative exercise, I'm going to do a thought experiment that we sometimes resurrect at Rolly during hack days. Um, this is a matrix of um, trained neural probability functions. They don't add up to one because that's not how they work. But um, somebody has analyzed a corpus of Bach music and gone, right, start chord at the top, next chord down below. These, this is a map of chord transitions. Um, now, obviously, this isn't the best starting point if you're going to create a masterpiece that sounds like it's by Bach. Uh, there are all kinds of things that are missing from this graph that we might add if we wanted to make it more sophisticated. So the, the tonal landscape is very limited. There's no kind of concept of the center of tonality. Music in binary form will modulate to a related key in the middle and then go back at the end. And, and so there's all kinds of stuff about tonal function and phrase shaping and stuff that isn't covered by this matrix. But let's, let's just pretend it is for now. And let's say we can understand all this stuff and we can take a naive user and give them this little tool where you know, they, they've got a touch screen and they can go, right, we'll start off with one and then we'll move to five. Okay, you've moved from one to five. What's the next chord you'd like to choose in your kind of harmonic journey? And we can improvise around that. So, Will you go to four or one, because they're quite common? Um, lots of Bach values go one, five, one at the beginning. Beethoven's fifth piano concerto is based on one, five, one. Um, or do we want to go to a relative minor and mix things up a bit? Or do we want to go to the, to the median minor here and, and do some, um, and get, get ourselves started with a, some kind of sequence? Um, but this is something that's aimed at naive users. And eventually, they'll learn how these things sound and what to pick next. And eventually, they might get quite good at knowing what kind of piece of music it is they want to put together, and they'll learn how the tonal journey works. But what are we really trying to create? We've, we've broken things up into a probability tree. But really, a year of hard R&D and user testing later, what we've done is we've reinvented the bloody auto harp. This has existed for over 100 years. And um, so the question is, what is it you're trying to do? Um, and that's my, that's my 
provocative comment for the time being. That, um, that yeah, you can do this stuff, but, but you're probably reinventing an acoustic instrument or something that somebody has done with a different modality. And maybe there's a value in that. Maybe providing an auto harp app is, 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 is the next thing that people want. And maybe giving people a hand as to what chord might come next and not sound awful is, is, is a very useful feature. But, but in the end, if somebody has to learn how to use your tool in a creative way, then you might as well just give them this or give them a guitar and help them through that journey instead. So um, any kind of education journey that's as complex as music, you start your little frog here is at the bottom. Um, it's easy to learn. And you can't really have something that's easy to learn and very powerful and very expressive, because as you make this journey and develop facility for your instrument, you're training muscle memory. You're getting an appreciation for repertoire. You're training your taste. You're learning a bit about musicology and how stuff, stuff is put together as much as you're learning tunes. And so there is really no shortcut from getting from here to there. This game's always annoyed me. Why does an amphibious creature require turtles and logs to cross a river? But, but anyway, let's say we're just crossing the road. Um, so we can do things like um, somebody plays a phrase and it's not very good, it's not very articulated, and we can show them some legato and some phrase shaping and help them towards certain things. Um, but really, they've got to cross that motorway, and the, the best thing that we can do is um, help them out and take impediments out of their way, get the cars to slow down a little bit, offer them um, things that a, a music teacher would offer them, but far more expensively. So um, helping them out by choosing repertoire, signposts, rewards, pace setting. The reason why anybody who's classically trained pretty much has gone through the associated board exams is because they provide this framework. You get to reward yourself by tracking your own journey through music education. You get to compete with your friends. It's, these are the kind of very pow powerful parts of habit loops. And, there's no reason on God's earth why you need an associated board exam system to, um, to, to progress in music. The only reason really is psychological, but it's, it's very powerful psychologically, which is why they've got a good thing going on. No idea how we're doing for time, but I thought I'd put some deep dream art work in here. Um, what should we delegate to a computer and what shouldn't we? Um, you've seen these pictures before. This is Sergeant Pepper put through a dog filter. Um, and a 20 second explanation. That, that Google's Deep Dream AI, which recognizes pictures of dogs and things, can also turn up the dogginess in a picture that it analyzes. And you look at where it recognizes a dog, and you turn up the features that make it doggy, and you do that for a few iterations, and basically dogs emerge from everywhere. And it's wonderful, and it's just this. Apparently, it's like an acid trip, but I've not tried that yet, although it has been recommended to me on a number of occasions by a number of people, <laughs> not all of whom I trust. So we'll talk about augmented intelligence. And this is different from artificial intelligence because we're still giving human beings the agency of choice. Um, these are a few projects that Rolly has actually published about that go, go somewhere into this sort of human computer augmentation. Um, sound signature. So we have a synthesizer. We have hundreds of presets. And they're just names. And they've got names that come out of a Dulux color book or they're names that somebody has decided will make them easy to tag, and they're very long and ungainly. But anyway, we have these very evocative names about what it might sound like. So you'd expect a smoky rose to sound like a, a dull electric piano made sometime in the 1960s, maybe with a bit of scratchy noise on it. You'd expect a dulcimer mallet thing to be very percussive and very twangy. Uh, and really, all we've got is these names. Um, this system breaks down as soon as you start, letting people name their patches and then sharing them online. Uh, people aren't very good at categorizing their own work, and frankly, they can't be bothered. Very few people can be bothered with metadata unless they're being paid to do something. So um, what Sound Signature was, was a, a way of trying to reclaim the actual picture of the waveform and place some timbral information in there and add some data about how it will actually sound. So you can see that the palette has been chosen. It's a rainbow palette, which wasn't the best choice. And actually, user test proved that, so it's good to put in something you know isn't going to work. But um, so the blue shapes are kind of low frequency dominance in the sound, and these are all playing the same note, so it's all about harmonic content. And the reds, um, and as you get towards the low wavelength ends of the spectrum, uh, are a high frequency content. So you can see from the dulcimer mallet, there's a lot of surface detail. It starts red, it disappears to blue. There's also some blurring that goes on on the waveform. So things with um, principally low frequency content, quite dull stuff that's quite close to a sine wave, would actually be defocused. There's a blurring algorithm there, so we're 
open GLing up the waveform. There are some other little subtle things that we didn't really play much with, but for example, when there's a noise type, noise type signal, you'll see that we add some noise into the, into the waveform as a texture. So just by looking at fairly rudimentary, well, the MFCC criteria and just analyzing things quite quickly, we can, we can produce a waveform that functions as a waveform, so it gives you your envelope, but it also tells you a little bit about the timbre of the sound that's about to be played and speeds up browsing, because you can visualize what, you know, what, you're, what you're looking for, what kind of sound you're looking for, and very quickly with a system like this, look through hundreds of patches and find a, find a series of short, of short contenders. Uh, we didn't roll this out in the end, but it's something that still surfaces from time to time, and it's an ongoing research project. Another thing that we've done, or another thing that we're working on, and this is soon to be published, is some research with Queen Mary University London. Um, you've probably seen sample categorization done by AI before, you may have done, um, where you can, ca you can categorize thousands of drum samples by timbre and they're placed in clouds of context, so all the hi-hats will be grouped in one place and the snares will be grouped in another place and the kick drums will be grouped in a third place. And it makes navigation more easy. Um, we haven't sorted out the visualization yet, but the idea is you can do the same thing with drum loops. So if you're looking for a particular feel, um, this is just categorized by looking at the MIDI data from a drum loop and we're, um, extracting some features from it and trying to work out how similarity and difference works. So if you want to play, if, you want to, if you're looking for related drum, um, drum tracks to, to, to go with the feel of a piece of music you're trying to put together, that will make things easier. So it's a bit like sample classification, but it takes the next layer up to grooves. And again, you're putting human beings in charge of what they think is salient and the kind of sounds they want to hear. Built by a business, I'm now going to talk a little bit about the commercial pressures that we are under and where AI is, um, where AI is dealing with that. Now, being a hardware company, you have to start at the top. You have to start by building a low batch of something of high quality, which you understand quite well. You're building a halo product. Only rich people will afford it because your supply chain isn't sorted out and your economies of scale aren't sorted out. So every unit you sell is going to be expensive. So Roly started in 2013. Who, knows, who, who here doesn't know what a seaboard is? Right, 15 second pitch for a seaboard. We've taken a piano, we've melted the keys together. The advantage of doing that is that um, a piano isn't particularly expressive and it's something that the annals of music are filled with um, people whining about how inexpressive a piano is because you decide how hard to hit a note and when to hit it, and that's it. And that's the limit of the power that you have over, over the instrument and how long to hold it down for. While other instruments allow you to have a kind of dialogue with a note, you can swell, you can, if you've got an instrument with a, where you can change the pitch, you can do vibrato by wobbling your finger or whatever other mechanism you have. Flautists can use tremolo. There are all kinds of other features that other musicians can introduce where a, well, a pianist is just sitting there going, shall I take my finger off the note yet? Um, and the advantage of replacing a piano keyboard with something that looks like a piano, so keyboard players aren't alienated, but something that performs where you can have a dialogue with the instrument, where you can adjust the pressure on your finger as you're holding a note down, where you can do finger wobbling vibrato, where you can change the timbre by, by moving across the fingerboard while a note is playing, liberates the instrument. So that, that, was, that was the idea of a seaboard. Fairly limited appeal, but, but not so limited that it wasn't a company. So the obvious thing to do after this would be to shrink it, target it at, um, at musicians that were willing to try and give it a go but couldn't afford the several thousand dollars that the original seaboards cost. Um, so we came out with a rise. So 10 times meant that we sold a few thousand of seaboard grand and we sold a few tens of thousands of seaboard rise, which in our industry makes it a successful MI product, musical instruments, sorry, jargon. So cheaper, more integrated, targeted at people who are using digital audio workstations. So there's this whole panel over here, replacing the very minimal surface of Seaboard Grand and enabling people to change octaves and change patches and do other things at the touch of a button. And, um, and we, and we um, didn't quite knock a zero off the price, but we divided it by an integer that was greater than two. So that's the second album. Um, when you're, e even if you're not, even if you don't have venture capitalists invested in you, there is a lot of pressure, both implicit and explicit, to keep on growing. So you do your 10x there, and the next thing is, okay, how do you get to 100 times the size you were at Seaboard Grand? And that's where things get quite difficult. And in 2016, we released Blocks, so it's cheaper still. 
Um, we've got to reach a bigger market than just professional musicians, so we're looking beyond music. And actually, an implicit goal of this was to showcase the sensor technology so that we could go to other people who weren't making musical instruments, might be making industrial or automotive control, and go, here is, a, here is a software development kit. This is what the technology can do. Are you interested in it? That didn't actually happen. We never got around to doing it because we were too busy shipping musical instruments. But um, that was one of the ideas. It's pocket size, so you can take it with you. You can link it to a mobile, mobile app. Um, and beyond just a melodic instrument, it's also a percussive instrument. In fact, principally, this little thing here is um, 16 by 16, some, sorry, 4 by 4. What is it? The sensors aren't, but it's, it's nominally a 4x4, 5x5 pad controller, and you can change the resolution of it. Uh, you can unclip it magnetically from everything else that's sold with it, put it in your pocket, and, and, and take it and compose on the go. So it is quite appealing, and we didn't quite get to 100 times where we were with Seaboard Grand. We got within, we, I think we got within a binary fraction of it, but we, we did quite well. Um, it was a very successful musical instrument product, but it still didn't break out of the genre. So the question is, how do you keep growing? Once you've saturated a market with this kind of thing, where do you go from here? Um, and, and AI is really the answer. Um, what you need to do is you need to start embracing this associated board style network effect. And back in 2015, we bought a company called Blend, um, doing something entirely different and allowing producers and musicians to share their stems online and, and so that other people could remix them. And it was a bit like a sound cloud, but for multi-channel mixes and a social media platform as well. With the idea being that by reducing the, friction of, um, uh, reducing the friction of what would otherwise be a really onerous and difficult task, you could build communities, you could engage people, and, and the network effect would take off and people would recommend things to each other and, uh, uh, and, and you'd have this experience that was very compelling. And we transformed this into noise.fm, which is the same kind of thing, but for loops that you make using a Seaboard block. Um, this is still very much a Mark I platform. And it's missing social features. But what AI can possibly do is um, work on filtering and recommendations. And if tracks are uh, I'm working on trying to get an impression for how finished tracks are. And if somebody really wants instant gratification, wants to listen to a finished product, which of these things are finished products? Because the difficulty with both this and blend with AI is, um, is Spotify is onto a very good thing um, because They've got a whole corpus of people who already know what to listen to. With stuff like this, people are posting stuff that no one has listened to before, without any kind of sense of cultural, cultural context already established. So recommendation algorithms, if they're not done properly, will just favor people who have already posted material that people have liked, and new entrants will be locked out. So you really need AI to help you in this. And again, you have the problem that users will not categorize music themselves. Or they'll just kind of spam tag it in the hope that everybody will find what they're putting out. And none of that's very helpful. Reinforce habit loop. This isn't us, this is melodics. But um, any kind of program that assists in music education and can act like a surrogate teacher and can tell you whether you're using correct or incorrect technique and, and will be both kind of a little lenient on you and a little strict on you. So if you're playing in time or not, if you're playing the track that you were meant to play. Uh, music lessons aren't like typing tutors. If you play a wrong note, um, a lot of it is about how you style things out rather than um, that you should be penalized based on your accuracy. So it's quite hard to get this stuff right by AI, but Melodix is trying to have a very good go. And the reason why I used them as an example is because we did a tie-in with them recently. Um, and the other thing is discover other intuitive ways and modalities to create music. So a patent is a very boring illustration, and it's even more boring to read, but I couldn't think of a way to, to convey this. So this is a patent that we put in place. Um, it's something called groove mode, and the idea of groove mode is that you can play a drum loop on an expressive instrument. And as you modulate pressure, you can make the drum loop do a bit more. So you start light touch, very minimalist drums, heavier touch, you bring in some more drums, very heavy touch, you bring in an awful lot more drums, you start moving your finger, it gets more syncopated. So you have this kind of elastic drumming. So people are satisfied by the fact that what they're doing is expressive and it's changing the music in a way that they intend, but you don't have to give them all that complexity of drum pattern programming up front. They can learn it and they probably will at some other time. So these are where intelligence can augment the experience for a naive musician, hold their hand a little, but keep them in control. Um, this slide is in the wrong place, because I've already talked about it in service of a musician. But I want to join up my thinking from earlier in this with um, 
the stuff that um, with the stuff I was talking about to do with business strategy. When's up? I'm going to use this device very briefly and very glibly called The Grid, because I was asked to review this business book a few months ago. A chap called Matt Watkinson has written a book called The Grid. Um, he spent years researching it, and basically he's decided that um, everything you need to worry about a business's health, everything you need to think about when you plan a business can be seen on a three-by-three three matrix. So you've got desirability, profitability, longevity, the three things you need to look after to make sure that you can stay in business. Um, your relationship with your customers, your relationship with your market, which in his sense refers to other companies, suppliers and rivals and so on, and, and how it, what it does for your organization. So very glibly, I'm just going to consider two corners because this is a useful little exercise for saying the following point. Intense. Um, customer desirability. You start a business generally because you've got the top left-hand corner of the grid worked out in your head. You've identified a need for a product or you've identified a barrier, as we did with Seaboard, an expressive music for keyboard musicians, where you want to take that barrier out of the way and there's something you can do in order, to, in order to make that happen. So generally, people start in business because they understand the customer desirability aspect. When venture capitalists get involved, and when your business matures, and when there's a pressure to scale relentlessly, you find yourself stuck in the top right-hand corner. And this really is where AI turns a little bit banal and almost evil. But um, in order to maintain a customer base, in order to grow one by an order of magnitude every couple of years, um, you've got to get awareness sorted out. So you've got to market and advertise and, and promote almost to death. Acquisition is very important. So how many people are downloading your app and using it? And retention. So the amount of eyeball time that users, users have, say, six months after they've installed your product, are they still using it? Are they using it more or less? And these are all things that this kind of top right-hand corner of the grid, customer longevity is what, um, is what you worry about when you scale. And it's what you worry about if you want to stay in business and, and grow to any degree, really. But actually, if you're a big tech company and you're already worth a trillion dollars, that's basically the only thing that your organization is really optimized for. You've got to, you've got to continue bringing the money in. Um, this is where things get a bit silly with AI. Um, because basically... How was I going to phrase this? Um, blah, 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 talk amongst yourselves. Right, the best practices in any kind of software company, and increasingly hardware, are agile, so you move quickly, and you don't flesh out a, pl a very detailed plan before you do things, just enough to let people know what it is they have to do. So every couple of weeks, you look at the product you're putting together, and then you decide on a direction for it. And the other thing is data science, so you're always looking at what your customers are doing looking at ways that you can make the experience um, frictionless for them. But unfortunately, agile and data science between them are not very good masters for your company. And what you end up doing is, is what Facebook has really ended up doing, that you're so data-driven and you're moving so quickly that any consideration of morality or what it is your customers actually want kind of goes out the window and you're basically just hacking their brains to make them addicted to something. And it goes from being something that was socially useful, as Facebook was, to something that's becoming a little socially pernicious. Um, so if I want to summarize what I'm trying to say from these three slides, it is you need a vision, and you need a strategy, and you need to keep that going, almost in spite of the pressure put upon you by external agencies to keep growing. And you need to understand what you're in the market for. And actually, listening to employees is a way of working that one out. Um, don't forget that feedback loop. The brains are usually in the building. They might not be being heard. Um, so, so we come straight back to Icarus again. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm appealing for a little injection of humanity into AI. But when it comes to learning music, human beings should and always will be in control. Um, music is created for people. And generally, it's more apt to be appreciated if it's generated also by people. And there are things that we can do to get out of people's way. Um, so. In conclusion, do what a computer can't do, uh, and decide that eating the world is not a game you want to play. Um, and it's probably better to play another game instead. Thank you very much. OK, we have a question over there. Thanks. <coughs> Very interesting presentation. Thank you. I have a question uh, regarding the products, uh, but from a perspective of, you know, what someone I discussed and you discussed, like, 
complexity and uh, how people relate with music production and mm. instruments. How do you think, how much do you think it backfired to have such a creative, you know, um, instrument in the market, uh, which goes into the territory of learning a new instrument, basically. So we go back to what I said, complexity and investing a lot of time to mm. learn a new paradigm. How much do you think it backfired to be so innovative uh, to Rowley? That's a good question, and we're kind of aware that by starting off with a sort of high-end instrument that's only really accessible if you already know your way around a keyboard, generally, um, that limits the appeal. And we're looking into ways of, um, ways of lessening that. So, for example, Blocks really came into its own as a percussion controller, and that's much easier to play generally because you can play on it like banging on a drum. Actually, Seaboard is probably not a beginner's instrument, although we find that children are more apt to get it than um, intermediate-level musicians because they already bring their prejudices to the table. But it's a good question. And Thank you. It's just a natural way for Rolly to go to start building these smaller instruments and then go, right, well, how do we find a bigger market? So that's, that's, that's a task we've picked. Thank you. Do we have another question? No more questions? Get a microphone, please. Yeah, no, it's just a, a really simple question about the, you know, that sort of square thing mm -hmm. that you had. Is that a pressure sensor, or is it? Uh, did you hover your hand above it? How does that work? Um, here we go. Back to blocks. Actually, this is called yeah. the beat maker kit. So there's three things you see in this picture, and they're all separate modules. But this block here, it's pressure sensitive. And it's arbitrarily continuous as well. So it's a little bit like a touch screen, but one that you can press into. Yeah. With a 15 by 15 LED matrix on so top. It'll give you like X, Y coordinates type yeah. thing. So you get X, Y and pressure. Can you do anything to also give you It is a project that we occasionally look into. Okay. Um, it's, well, it's technically hard, and we're not sure what the use case is yet. So, okay. so it's, it's something we've demonstrated in a lab. Okay, do we have, we have another question at the back? Yeah, um, I tried the Rally keyboard in a, a shop a couple of, about a month or so ago, and I was totally entranced by it. I Great. think it's absolutely brilliant. When can you build me a mixing desk? When can you, because I thought it was just such a fantastic thing to use, and it was so inspiring. And I want people like you to build mixing desks for people like me who want to use something different and start thinking about things in a different way. Right. So when are you going to do it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a chat afterwards. <laughs> Will do. Again, it's down to the user experience and trying to build something that people are willing to buy. Because there's a real problem with building something as expensive as a mixing desk, but if you alienate enough people, no one's going to buy it, or you'll sell two or three. <clears throat> yeah, I, mean, I think just the way of just use it, just the whole MIDI control thing, because you know, we can use MIDI control to control so many different things in the in the industry. Yeah. <clears throat> just kind of that adaptable, the way you just can, you know, move your fingers about in such a tactile way. I just thought was so inspiring. It's and completely user programmable too. It's it like is something we've thought about, um, <laughs> but, but it's, music control is an even smaller market at the moment than musical instruments. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's worthy of some thought. If we can prove that there's, there's an audience, so I'm sure it's something that we'd do. Well, I hope there will be. Thanks. Thank you. We have one, time for one more question, if there's one more question. No more questions. Of course, you could start with a block. And... Um, do your own. <laughs> That's always an option. They're quite hackable. Okay, let's thank Ben again.